Such as this. Would an ape make a human doll that talks? Welcome back to Badass Digest. This is part two of our epic examination of Planet of the Apes. I, I know what you're thinking. Planet of the Apes, two episodes. I love this movie and I really want to share that with you. And I want to make sure that you kind of get a real taste of what makes Planet of the Apes so special. My name is Devin Faraci and this is Badass Digest. There's a lot that I love about Planet of the Apes. The filmmaking is incredible. Uh, Franklin Schaffner, who directed Patton and Papillon, he doesn't think he's making a pulpy action adventure movie. He's taking it really seriously. It takes almost 30 minutes for the first ape to show up in the movie. This is despite the fact that the apes are the main selling point. Uh, in fact, the first half hour of the movie is largely silent as the astronauts wander through this blasted uh, hellscape and begin to discover the world that they're in. Our heroes stumble upon an open field and there are these primitive looking humans. They don't speak. This is the best they've got around here. In six months, we'll be running this planet. All of a sudden, there's a strange cry in the distance. The humans begin freaking out. There's these huge stalks of corn. The stalks begin to sway back and forth. Something is riding through them. You can see sticks coming out and hitting each side of the corn. They're driving the, the humans out from the corn. A horse bursts out. The camera turns around and we see our first ape on horseback. Charlton Heston has this incredible moment, without saying a word, of just his mind being utterly blown. I've seen the movie a hundred times. Each single time, it's an incredible reveal. Uh, it's just impeccable filmmaking. It's the kind of thing that doesn't rely on shock, it relies on buildup, it relies on creating a sense of atmosphere and a sense of the moment. At one point, Taylor's on trial. Uh, the idea of a talking human is just absolutely impossible for ape society to understand. And there's actually an argument in the trial about whether or not, as a human, Taylor has any standing in an ape court. In all fairness, you must admit that the accused is a non-ape and therefore has no rights under ape law. Then why is he called the accused? What's happening here is the Dred Scott case is playing out in front of our eyes just in the guise of a science fiction movie, whether or not a person is a person, whether or not a person has rights. Putting Charlton Heston in that role was kind of amazing at the time. See, at the time, in 1968, the counterculture was blossoming, everything was changing, the civil rights movement was in full swing. Charlton Heston, in a lot of ways, represented everything that was square about Hollywood. In my world, when I left it, only kids your age wore beards. He was this barrel-chested guy from the 40s and 50s who had been in some of the greatest big epics of all time, playing a guy who, at the very beginning of the film, is com a complete misanthrope. I can't help thinking somewhere in the universe there has to be something better than man. Has to be. And so here's this character who do doesn't love humanity, going off to this other planet, what he thinks is another planet, and discovering his humanity, discovering that he really does care about people. Imagine me needing someone. Back on Earth, I never did. And then he goes off down the beach and finds what Dr. Zayas calls his destiny. And all of a sudden, he realizes everything that he ever thought about humanity, that we were base, that we were greedy, that we were stupid, that we were self-destructive, was totally true. We wiped ourselves out. And at the end, his arc of redemption, of becoming a better man, is totally undercut by the fact that humanity is horrible and we've killed ourselves. You blew it up! Casting him as Colonel Taylor is one of the most amazingly subversive things the movie does. It really begins also Hessen's most interesting phase of his career, at least for me. This is weird trilogy of, 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 of science fiction movies, dystopian science fiction movies specifically. Planet of the Apes in 68, then The Omega Man, which is a remake of The Last Man on Earth, a Vincent Price movie, where uh, Charlton Hessen is literally the last man on Earth, uh, fighting against a, a savage race of vampire creatures. And then Soylent Green, which is the only movie that's amazingly spoiled by everybody. Fight for survival and try to solve the most bizarre riddle ever to face mankind. The search for the secret of Soylent Green. Because everybody knows what Soylent Green is. It's We live in a world where everything is CGI. Everything is made out of pixels. The, the reboot of Planet of the Apes has some incredible CGI work from Weta uh, and some astonishing motion capture acting by Andy Serkis, who plays Caesar, uh, the main ape. It's never gonna be the same as John Chambers' incredible work, especially in the first Planet of the Apes. What J John Chambers was able to do was create something physical and tangible. What I kind of love about the makeup in Planet of the Apes is that nobody makes a big deal out of the fact that this is not what apes look like. And I think that's kind of fun and sort of speaks to the stuff that I grew up with. The idea that 
You know what, chimpanzees are not six feet tall and nobody makes mention of it. They should be three and a half foot tall uh, monkeys. Whatever, we're just gonna go with it because it's about meeting the movie halfway and that's the beauty of, this, of the physical effects work is that we're meeting the movie halfway in a real physical, tangible space. You forget that this is a makeup at all. These are just characters. Uh, Roddy McDowell is able to completely emote in every possible way as Cornelius. Uh, it's an incredible performance that is not in, at all hindered by the makeup and potentially is enhanced by it. And McDowell, by the way, would is probably the person most associated with Planet of the Apes. He would go on to star in four of the five sequels. He wasn't able to make it back for Beneath, the second film. He went on to also star in the TV series as a different character, Galen. By the end of the series, the fifth film, Battle for the Planet of the Apes, the makeup was cheaper, they weren't spending as much money on it, um, but McDowell was just as committed as ever, and uh, out of all the problems of Battle of the Planet of the Apes, you will never say that McDowell's performance as Caesar is one of them. He's, he's just incredible in that movie. Planet of the Apes was an enormous success. It was a huge hit. And I'm not sure anybody really saw it coming. They rushed uh, more movies into production. Uh, they wanted Heston to come back. Heston had some very specific demands on what it would take to bring him back for a sequel beneath the Planet of the Apes. Taylor. Uh, there were a number of different versions of what a sequel should be like. Uh, over time, they finally settled on one real strange idea. The heavens declare the glory of the bomb, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There's a bit of conventional wisdom that says Star Wars is the movie that invented major merchandising. Like toys and tie-ins really began with Star Wars. But the reality is that Planet of the Apes uh, was first. Planet of the Apes was a franchise that was making Fox all kinds of merch money. Uh, there was eventually a TV show and a cartoon. The five films would play together in, in apathons at drive-in movie theaters. The movie poster would urge you to go ape. The basic design of these apes was just so perfect and so primal. The idea of the chimps wearing green, the gorillas wearing purple, the orangutan Tangs in that mustard orange. Uh, I had the Mago toys. I have a Planet of the Apes uh, board game at home right now from 1968. Uh, it's not a very good game. Uh, of course, Tim Burton came back and uh, did a remake, and uh, it was a movie that everybody hates. And it's kind of interesting because Burton's version is not a straight remake of Planet of the Apes. It's actually very close to Pierre Boulle's original book. In, in Boulle's book, the Planet of the Apes is a, a planet in another solar system. And at the end of the book, the hero comes back to Earth, but because of the relativistic nature of traveling at the speed of light, thousands of years have passed. He returns to Earth and discovers that on Earth, apes have also evolved. So as cheesy and dumb as that is in the movie, it actually is closer to the original spirit of the book. Whatever happens, you know, with the new reboot series, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is in production right now, we're always going to associate Planet of the Apes with one specific image, and that is the Statue of Liberty buried right up to her chest, Charlton Heston on his knees crying about the fate of humanity. Oh, if you guys like this and uh, you want to let me know, I'll be happy to come back and talk to you more about all the rest of the Planet of the Apes movies. I think Beneath the Planet of the Apes has probably the single most f***ed up ending of any science fiction movie I have ever seen in my entire life. Uh, which is your favorite Planet of the Apes movie? Are you a, a diehard Tim Burton Planet of the Apes person? If so, I would love to meet you because you're the only one of your kind. Uh, are you interested in the new reboot series? Do you like Escape or Beneath? Uh, be sure to subscribe so that you can see all of our future episodes. I'll be back again next week with something totally different, something just as badass. My name is Devin Faraci, and this is Badass Digest. Jack and Uncle Al discuss their favorite holiday movies and how the ultimate Christmas story is about a bisexual, crack-addicted cop. As awards season approaches, Gray Drake lists the 10 movies that won't be on anyone's shortlist. Ben Lyons gives you his best and worst movies of 2012 and reviews Django Unchained, Zero Dark Thirty, and This Is 40. Devin Faraci goes off the nerd deep end in an illuminating exploration of his favorite film, Planet of the Apes. Get your film fix. Subscribe to Cinefix.